Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 9. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of heaven who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from him, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand, I will keep you, and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and the new things I declare before they spring into being. I announce them to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My reading this morning is from Matthew three thirteen to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we pray? Father, we like to thank you for gathering us like this on this day when we celebrate the baptism of our Lord and communion together. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for helping us survive 2016. And now as we start 2017, we look up to you for guidance and for comfort and for strength for 2017. And this guidance, this comfort, this strength comes from you and your word. Lord, we pray that you would humble us right now so that we may receive your word from you. Our prayer uh, as people of yours will be to say, um, speak, Lord, uh, for your servants here. Uh, May the words of my mouth um, and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Uh, We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I started work here uh, on November 17, 2016. Uh, And before that, I spent 20 months looking for employment and studying at Knox College. The main reason why I studied at Knox College, which is the training institution of the Presbyterian Church, was because I wanted to equip myself for the next stage of, of ministry. I had been involved in ministry for 20 years before that. But also, I needed to, to do that year at Knox so that I will be able to get the credentials, if you like, uh, to serve as a pastor uh, within this denomination. So I remember on the first day I started work, I asked Glenda to send you all an email and ask all of you to pray for me um, as I make this transition from 20 years of uh, looking for work and studying to uh, a working life again, and that's a huge uh, transition. Now, when I started work, it did not dawn on me that it was November 7th, not July 7th. There's a huge difference in the church calendar between November 7th and July 7th. When you come to a church in November 7, it's not just trying to get used to what the church is like and the people and the processes and the system, 
but it was the November 7th, just before the Christmas season. And so therefore, I discovered that when I started work here, I not only needed to know a little bit more about the church and get immersed in it, I had to prepare for Christmas. And each particular church has its own way of approaching Christmas in terms of putting up decorations and special services. And I had to find out and get myself, if you like, prepared for it and, and make sure that all the stuff that we usually do for the Christmas season was done. Okay. Then, on top of that, uh, before I came to this church, uh, throughout the whole year, the session was struggling with the issue of the, uh, of the refugee initiative. And so uh, I discovered that uh, we needed to bring forward this issue before the congregation, before the end of the year, so that we could start, uh, if you like, the initiative for 2017, practically and financially. And being a person who likes to be really prepared before we have any kind of congregational meeting, uh, there was a lot of legwork that needs to be done, and we had that congregational meeting on December the 11th. Okay. Now, before I started work officially, uh, I had a candidate here and had a meet and greet uh, here. And at that meet and greet, I met Bob Simpson for the first time in my life, and we kind of joked a lot. And it was great to meet Bob. Uh, then, before I started here officially, I found out that Bob was in um, Credit Valley Hospital, and it's great to see you here today, Nancy. And uh, I, I still remember uh, writing this email, this prayer email for Nancy just before he, she, he, he moved to uh, St. Mike's, uh, because I, although I, before I became a pastor, I, I just wanted Bob and Nancy to realize that I, I was praying uh, for them. And then, when I started work here, I felt that I should go visit uh, Bob and Nancy at St. Mike's, and, and I really did, and it was a great afternoon getting to know you and, and Bob, and trying to find out a little bit more about who he was and uh, his childhood at Port Credit. But little did I know that after that visitation with Bob and Nancy, that a month later, we would be celebrating Bob's life in this very hall. Okay? So, to say the least, November and December have been pretty busy months uh, for me in pastoral mis ministry. And I am so grateful that everything happened the way it did. Because uh, with all this Christmas and the funeral and the congregational meeting and everything else, I got to meet a lot of people. And as a pastor, people are important in my life. And I will always look back to November and December 2016 as a time in which we laughed together, we cried together, we celebrated things together, we grieved together. And so, therefore, all this is to show you that uh, I was immersed, I was baptized, I was dipped into pastoral ministry the last two months. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, asked Jesus if they could sit at Jesus' right and Jesus' left in glory. And this is what Jesus says to them. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the drink and be baptized with the baptism uh, that I am baptized with? And that illustrates the true meaning of the Greek word baptizo there, which means to immerse, to dip, to be baptized. And so therefore, Jesus is saying to John, James and John, if you want to sit on my right, on my life, can you handle the baptism of suffering that I'm going through now, which you as a believer of Jesus will go through in your life? Okay? And so as you know, uh, James had to, he, he was actually executed in the early stages of Acts, and John uh, gave us the last book of the, new, of the Bible, and he was persecuted by his faith as he wrote Revelation. So when we understand the original meaning of the Greek word baptizo, we know now why a lot of people were coming to John the Baptist at the River Jordan. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize, he will immerse, he will dip you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So John's words are pretty strong. Repent. We don't like to hear this word. It means turn your life around. And John says, I prepare the way for the Lord. Uh, the Lord is coming. He's going to immerse you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Get serious about God. Immerse yourself in God. Baptize yourself in the kingdom of heaven. Turn away from your sinful life. And if you want to show you mean business uh, with God, Come to me now at the river, and I'm going to immerse you, baptize you with the water, and when you come out of the water, you are going to be a changed person because you're going to live the rest of your life for Jesus. You're going to immerse yourself into God from here on. So therefore, uh, that's probably the main reason why people came uh, to John for baptism. They, were want, they wanted to immerse themselves in God and just the act of being baptized by John was kind of a reflection of their, their life from now on, that they were going to live their life for Jesus uh, from then on. And then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And John tried to uh, deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? John is shocked. This is the Jesus whom John claims to be more powerful than him, whose sandals he is not willing, even worthy to carry. This is the Jesus who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire after John leaves the scene. This is the Lord for whom he prepared the way for as a prophet in the wilderness for many years. So John's response is understandable. I need to be baptized by you, Jesus, and do you come to me? Um, I have been talking about you and your baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire all these years, and now you have arrived. Um, you should be baptizing from now on. In fact, I should be baptized by you, Jesus. Uh, I feel so unworthy uh, to baptize you, Jesus. Now, I believe when John the Baptist is telling Jesus that he should be baptized by Jesus himself, he is actually merely being obedient to the call that God has given to him so far. Okay, there's, there's, he, 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 God has revealed his mission in life, John the Baptist, and his mission in life is to prepare the way for the Lord. And so now the Lord has come, it is the Lord who should baptize him, not he baptized the Lord. So, uh, the practical implications is this. Sometimes, after a few years in being faithful to God and following a certain path in our lives, um, whether in uh, our job or in a family circumstance or uh, in our neighborhood, uh, and God uh, calls us to that position and, and, and He wants us to be faithful and obedient to Him. But then suddenly, uh, Jesus comes to the river to be baptized by John. Suddenly, uh, God strikes us, if you like, and starts us thinking. And then perhaps our response is just like John. What are you doing, Jesus? What are you doing? Uh, it is I who should be baptized by you. W why are you bringing this change of circumstance into our life right now? Um, I've been so faithful in this path for many years, and now you want me to change my life? Are, are you really talking to me, God? Can I really hear you, God? I will call her Mary. Mary looked after her husband who had a disability for 20 years. She also ran a restaurant in Vancouver at that time. Mary grew up in the church, but she stopped going to church when she got married. And when Mary came to, to, to see me, she said, you know, I kind of kept the door open for the Lord. I kept on reading his word and praying, but more out of a routine, more out of habit. Uh, life got very busy for me because I was looking after my husband and I was running that restaurant um, in Vancouver. Then Mary told me, 
I've just been diagnosed with cancer in the esophagus. And I have been given one year, just one year to live. And as I embrace this, this uh, limitation of life that God has given me, I want to return to the church and I want to get baptized. Can you help me? And uh, that, those three or four months of helping Mary to prepare for her baptism and get it, getting her ready to, to, to face the reality of what was before her were, were three or four months of incredible learning for me. Uh, you know, it was more, uh, it was more, I learned things from Mary rather than me as the pastor teaching her things. Because I believe that Mary taught me how to be open to God when he leads you in new pathways. Now, I don't say it was easy for her. Uh, it was very difficult. And I think she prayed a lot of the time. But in her gentle manner, she taught me how to accept the reality of what God is doing in our lives and to prepare ourselves for the next stage of life that God calls us to. So, how does Jesus respond to John? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us uh, to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. So what is this new deal that Jesus is mentioning to John here? Uh, I need to be baptized by you to fulfill all righteousness. What does Jesus mean by that? Okay, so you need to remember that when people are coming to John to be baptized, they are coming from their world. And this is what I call the world of fallen humanity, the world that struggles to find God. And so they come to John, and they want to get serious with God, and they want to immerse themselves in God. So John says to them, go for it if you want to immerse yourself in God. Let me immerse you in the water now as a sign that you are going to be living the rest of your life for this coming king. Okay, so they get baptized by John in the River Jordan and they move towards life with God. They move towards life in repentance, a turning away from their sin. Okay, so that's the direction of the people who come to John at the River Jordan for baptism. However, remember, we have just celebrated Christmas. Uh, what does Christmas tells, tell us? Uh, Christmas is a time when we celebrate God coming down to earth as a human being, as the baby born in that manger in Bethlehem. So if Jesus is God, he comes from a different direction. He comes from life with God. So compared to to Jesus, to John's disciples who move from sinful humanity and get baptized and go towards God, what is Jesus doing when he asks John to be baptized in the River Jordan? Jesus is coming from life in heaven with God and he says to John, John, let me be baptized by you to fulfill all righteousness. Now why is Jesus saying that? It is because when Jesus gets baptized by that mere human being called John the Baptist, he is identifying himself with humanity, with people. He as God is saying to John, I need to be baptized by you, a mere human being, because it is a sign of me identifying with humanity who needs salvation, who needs righteousness, who needs uh, God to work in their life. I am the God who has come from heaven to create change in this world. And so in getting baptized by John and in some ways uh, signifying to the world that he is identifying with the rest of humanity, Jesus doesn't go back to life in heaven with God. He goes instead and he identifies with sinful humanity 
And you know the story after that, after he gets baptized at, at the River Jordan. He will then go to that cross and he will die for humanity in that cross and then he will resurrect himself and we're going to, we're going to celebrate that at Easter and Good Friday. But when Jesus says that he is going to be baptized by John to fulfill all righteousness. He is trying to tell us that from now on, this is the start of the mission God has called me to, and I am going to identify with all the people of the world now. I am going to die on the cross for the rest of humanity. And to symbolize this, John, I need to be baptized by you, a mere human being, because I want to identify with the rest of the human race which you uh, uh, represent, because I'm going to die for them on the cross three years from now. And so when Jesus dies on the cross three years from now, he's going to look back to this time when he gets baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist as the start of his mission. The start of his mission in identifying with sinful humanity and dying for sinful humanity. And so therefore, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, you have, to me, the mission of Christ uh, articulated. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be seen for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, it's the start of Jesus' mission. But there is also another reality to the baptism of Jesus, which we are now going to try to understand. And may I ask that we read this Genesis passage, then after that also read uh, that Matthew 3 passage again. So, let's just start to read together. Shall we read together? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Matthew 3. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Do you see the two pictures here? One of creation and one of what I call re-creation. At the creation story, the, the, the world is void and empty, and there's darkness, and what's happening? The Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And then, uh, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, now, the speech of God in creation uh, is the salvation of God, if you like, for that situation. Because he, from then on, in the seven days of creation, uh, God is bringing order out of the chaos of the earth being null and, 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 and void, empty and void. And also, you see that God creates by speaking. Okay, he, he speaks as his act of creation. Uh, at Christmas time, we read these uh, very uh, famous verses that start John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made, and with him, nothing was made that has been made. And so, therefore, I believe that and that word is Jesus. So in some ways, God's speech is Jesus, both at creation, but also at the incarnation. And now, at Jesus' baptism, you see the three persons of the Trinity being involved uh, in it. There is water, the Spirit of God descends like a dove on Jesus and alights on Him like the Spirit of God hovering over the waters in the creation story. In the creation story, God speaks let there be light, and there was light. Now God the Father speaks, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And so therefore, in the Bible, when the Holy Spirit comes on someone, whether it's Jesus or whether it's some other person like Paul or Peter, uh, he is anointed for mission. So here the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus, and now Jesus 
is anointed for his mission of the next three years. So the question is this, is Jesus' mission a new mission by God to restore a fallen world? Is, is Jesus' mission on this earth to, if you like, recreate the, the world that it should be after the fall of humanity in the garden? Is Jesus God's second act of creation? After all, he is the subject of the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament talks about how God created the world and he uh, put together the people named Israel. But we all know that the Old Testament ends in a lot of despair. And so now, God is starting a new uh, mission, if you like, in, in, in God's life. And he has sent Jesus in this world to recreate, to restore salvation, if you like, uh, to the, the heavens and the earth. And so, what does Jesus' mission involve? What, he has come so that uh, he will restore us as human beings to have fellowship with God. So, God made him who had no sin to be seen for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And this is more than just us being restored into a position with God. You, what I'm trying to say here is, is that when Jesus comes to this earth, his mission is to bring us back to God, but his mission is also to restore creation to the way things should be. And when he comes and starts this meal, this meal is a testimony to the mission of Jesus. In a few moments, we are going to participate in this meal, and I'm going to ask you this question. Are you going to co-participate in Jesus' mission? Because uh, he has done all this for us, and he has restored us to a position with himself. And... Just as Jesus, people came to the river and are challenged to get baptized, now when we come to this meal, I would like to ask you, are you ready to accept what Jesus has done in your life? Okay? So can we read uh, these verses in 1 Corinthians 11 that will now uh, put us into the mood for the meal of God, the meal that is uh, Jesus' uh, start, if you like. In, in, it has meaning in the Last Supper. It has become the Lord's Supper, and I like to call it Jesus' meal because Jesus' meal reminds us of Jesus' mission. So let us read this in preparation for the Lord's Supper or communion. 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim Jesus' mission until he comes. So people were coming to John the Baptist for the baptism of repentance. And if they meant business with God, they would get baptized by John the Baptist. This is the first Lord's Supper for 2017. And I'd like to ask you this question. Do you mean business with God? If you realize that you have not lived the life that you should have been living for Jesus and you need forgiveness, come to the table. Because it is on the cross that Jesus says, I identify with, human, with the rest of human, humanity and I die for human beings. And so I invite you to come to this table and, and make this participation in this meal as a sign of you appropriating the forgiveness of Christ in your soul. Now, perhaps some of you uh, believe in Jesus, 
but you feel that you haven't done enough to co-participate with Jesus in his mission, to tell others about him coming to the world. This word, to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I ask you also to consider partaking of this meal and realigning yourself with the mission of Jesus in your life. So whether you want to ask forgiveness from Jesus or whether you want to recommit yourself to Jesus, this meal is open to you. And Jesus offers himself to you in, fellowship of, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and he calls you to come and have a meal with him.